sit down. So I do things just a little different. Um, it, you picked up already. Right? So there's no words to it. No. I want you to listen to it. Sometimes we can learn a lot, especially through music, just by listening. You know, it says, you know, raise your voice in song, and that's great. But sometimes we need to listen and understand what the words are in the song uh, without trying to, oh, am I singing it right? Is these the right words? That's a particular song that I think a couple people here needed, um, including myself. You know, he's strong, you know, and, and, and I'm weak. And sometimes we lose sight of that. So, <clears throat> the other thing <clears throat> that, we, um, that we're going to do a little different today who prays daily? Great. Who needs prayer daily? Even better. So we always have a prayer request. So, I believe that some prayer requests are very, very personal. And they're between you and God. And God knows what those prayer requests are. So what I want you to do this morning is if you need prayer for you, for somebody, for the world, for anybody, I want you to raise your hand really high. All right, now I want you to leave them high. We're going to go to prayer, and God knows what we want to pray about. We're going to raise them high, and we're going to let God know that we are praying for what's in our hearts and what's in our minds, because He knows. God is omnipotent. He knows. So as we go to prayer this morning, before we open, just keep your hands held high and your heart open. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all here together this morning. Thank you for waking each one of us up. And if, Lord, we know, you know what's in everybody's heart and what people need prayer for and who those prayers are directed to. Lord, we want you to hear these prayers. And if it's your will, please help us through whatever it is that we need our help, that we need help through. If it's healing or friendship or forgiveness, if it's world peace, Lord, you know what's in our hearts. Lord, be with us today. Help us get through whatever it is you're putting us through because we know we're going through it because that's your will and that you have a purpose for everything that you do. Lord, with these hands raised and these hearts open, we just pray this morning that the message we delivered is your word given from your scripture. And Lord, we thank you again for this glorious day and the opportunity you give us each and every day to fellowship, each and every day that you give us to wake up each and every day that you give us to praise your name and be witnesses and disciples for you. In your loving son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh, I've got a bigger good morning than you. Good morning. Oh, okay. yeah, you can always tell my poor people. They're like, oh, he's just going to keep saying it. So, so Ms. Ms. Banks called me out pretty quick. She said, she said, why are you all dressed up? I said, Ms. Banks was on the this morning. She said, so you get, you get dressed up for that? And I, I'm doing my surprise, but you're right. I don't leave this on when I, when I freeze. But for today, this has a very significant meaning, and I'm so glad Ms. Banks brought that up. Would you rather listen to somebody because they have a tie on or because they have a t-shirt on? Oh, hi, Seth Hi. <laughs> or because they have on nice shoes, or does it matter? Yeah. Does it matter if they have on a t-shirt and jeans? Would you take the message the same way? Jesus never cared about what he looked like. He didn't care about his dusty feet. He was more about loving each other, about the gospel that he was spreading. Um, Jesus never tried to be anybody that he wasn't. The disciples never tried to be anybody they weren't. As a matter of fact, they tried very hard to be to get away from what they were, you know, to be the tax collector and the doctor and the um, historian. So, I want us to try to do the same. Um, we're a judgmental society by nature. You know, how well we listen to somebody should not be based on what they're dressed in. Um, some of the best things I've heard were from from people who weren't dressed in the nicest things. Me and Barbara were talking this morning, you know, in, this, in the revivals in the 70s when they went um, when they went down to town. The preacher didn't wear shoes because he truly meant come as you are. And a lot of those towns had a lot of homeless and they didn't have shoes. So he wanted them to be comfortable and he wanted them to come as you are. So, um, Mr. Darrell was 
Miss Tara, they'll come back and forth. Tara would come back up. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to do is the, um, the natural scripture reading on what we're going to talk about today. shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. Thank you. And hey, just so everybody knows, that was my fault. I told her seven instead of seventeen. <laughs> if that's the worst thing I do today, we are way on top of the game. So, as in the Bible reading, today we're going to talk about transfiguration. Um, the transfiguration of Christ shortly before his crucifixion and right after the Epiphany. And um, the, the Epiphany, in case, um, in case anybody's wondering what that is, an Epiphany is a sudden burst of realization. You know what's about to happen or what the answer to your question is. Jesus' epiphany was, I'm going to die. This is really going to happen. They're really going to crucify me. So the, the transfiguration happened right after this epiphany. Um, so the first thing I, I want to get out of the way is the definition of the difference between transformation and transfiguration. So... The meaning of transformation, the act, process, or instance of changing a character or condition. So when I came in, I had on a tie. My shirt was buttoned up. Okay? I was very, very professional. So now that I took my tie off and I unbuttoned my shirt, I'm a little less professional. So it's a small transformation. All right? So... Transfiguration comes from the Latin roots, trans, which means across, and figura, which means form or shape. So this signifies a change of form or appearance. You know, um, everybody talks about my hair. Um, if I was running a bathroom and go back to being bald, I have actually <coughs> trans transfigured my appearance. It has changed. Um, so now we have a better understanding of two words. We want to play a game to test ourselves. All right? So, it's important to the lesson, and I love games, and I love Mr. Bean. So anybody who knows me loves up. I love Mr. Bean because he's, he's like the modern-day Charlie Chaplin. So, here we go. Transformation or transfiguration? Any idea? Transformation. Transformation. Because... He's, he's always Superman. He just throws on some glasses and he's Clark Kent. Clark Kent is always Superman. Right. I bet you didn't think I'd be a Superman into a certain digit. Just <laughs> Batman. Transformation or transfiguration? Transformation. Transformation. He is always Bruce Wayne. He just throws a mask on. But underneath the mask, he's still Bruce Wayne. Incredible Hulk. Oh, Transfiguration. Transfiguration. He is no longer Bill Bixby. He is in, in 
to that. He is definitely the Hulk. He has completely changed his appearance, his personality. He, he has gone from Bill Bixby to something completely different. Iron Man. Iron Man. Transformation. You know, he, he is um, he is always stark. You know, he uh, just throws on a suit and he just transforms himself. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Transformation. 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 He's still Peter Parker, just with a mask on. You know, he, he does it. He still has the same powers. You know, um, that's a good way to look at it. He is always Peter Parker. He's always Spider-Man. They're one and the same. Now we have the mouth. Transfiguration. That is Jesus's true form. Um, when Moses came down with the commandments, he had to have a veil after speaking to God. He had to have a veil on because he was still so radiant from speaking to God. If you look at the picture, even even their faces in the picture, they're they're actually seeing Jesus in his true form for the first time. And that is definitely transfiguration. So. How they do? To give you a pretty good understanding between the two of them, because this is really important to understand it, what this means. I mean, this is this is a part of the Bible that a lot of people don't really know about, don't really read about. So I want to make sure we understand what we're talking about. Otherwise, it's going to get skipped, and I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I'm explaining this very, very clearly, because it's actually a very important <clears throat> part of the Bible. Um, now, I want to talk about exactly what happened that day on the mountain. Um, and, and most theological scholars um, believe that it was Mount Vernon that this happened on. Go figure. That was a pretty neat little thing. You know, I know I had the same thing on Mount Vernon. <laughs> um, but there's nowhere in, in the Bible where it says exactly where this, um, what mountain this was, where it took place. So, in case you didn't realize, I am a huge, huge um, comic book guy. I love superheroes. Me too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and I also believe that I can't talk to you about anything unless I break it down to a simplest form first, and then we can really talk about um, a little bit more detail. So I'm, I have a short video I want you to, to just learn the story of what happened that day on the mountain. I have another love, by the way. Crowds say, uh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. And what about you? Who do you say I am? The Son of God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will give you the keys to the kingdom in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound to heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Never what? This shall never happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. You are something bog to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. This is my son. Whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Get up. Don't be afraid. Do not tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So, did we get anything out of that little video? I'm glad you liked this video. 
Um, there was a lot of symbolism in the transfiguration. Um, you had Elijah and Moses on the right and left of Jesus. Um, after God speaks and says he is well pleased with his son, Jesus is by himself. This is to symbolize the end of the Old Covenant, the end of the Old Testament, and the beginning of the New Covenant. That's going to start with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Um, could you imagine you have just seen someone you followed for almost two years in a bright, shiny light, and then you actually hear the voice of God, and you want to put a temple and tell everybody, and he says, no, 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 no. you can't tell anybody until I rise. Now, you've got to keep this. Could you do it? Some of us can't keep a secret that we hear on the telephone. It's, um, it, was a, it was a really big burden that, um, that they gave, that they were given. So we have to be careful about what we see, what we hear, what we read. And we have to start really looking into ourselves and making our own decisions about what we believe, what we don't believe, what others tell us to believe. You know, um, when I was when I was first introduced to church, uh, one of my biggest problems with the church was, why do I want to listen to somebody else tell me their interpretation of the Bible and I can read it all by myself? Well, I tell people all the time, there's a reason that this is called the living word. I'm going to tell you the facts. How you read it is going to be directly related to you. How I read this in my 20s is not how I read this in my 30s, is not how I read it in my 40s, and my understanding between readings became more in some parts, less in others. I was more curious about some parts, and I was less curious about some parts. So, I'm gonna give you a great example of making your own decisions. Um, a man was arraigned for murder in Los Angeles about 60 years ago. It was a difficult case and there was a lot of circumstantial evidence. Now, the man's defense lawyer, he thought he had an ingenious ploy. In his closing statement, he said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have to find my client not guilty of murder. If there is the slightest doubt in your mind that he is innocent, you cannot convict him. And then he said, now I have one final witness. The true murderer is about to walk through that door. All eyes swung toward the door, but no one came in. Now the lawyer continued, you see, ladies and gentlemen, there's doubt in your minds. Otherwise, you wouldn't have looked at the door. Now the jury retired to deliberate, and they came back five hours later with a guilty verdict. That lawyer was beside himself, and before the judge could pass sentence, he sprang up, and he said, but I proved that you all had a doubt about my client's guilt. How can you possibly find him guilty? You look toward the door. And a wise and old man, the jury stood up and said, as everyone else looked toward the door, I looked at your client. He did not look at the door because he knew there was nobody coming through it. He knew who the murderer was. He knew he was the guilty one. So in this instance, one man decided he was going to do it his way. He wasn't going to be led to look through the door. He was going to take a different approach. And this is what I want to talk about today. Now, in contrast to the Los Angeles courtroom where the star witness did not appear, this morning's gospel reading is all about a star witness who did appear. Imagine that you could hear the voice of God. Now, one thing that was in that video, the question that was on everybody's lips, who is Jesus? Who was the star witness? Who said, who answered? Who answered who is Jesus? The star witness, none other than God the Father, answered the question personally by revealing Jesus' glory to the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he said very clearly, this is my beloved son, and I am fully pleased with him. 
man, wouldn't that be great? When it comes time for us to be judges, is God going to be able to say that about you? Is God going to be able to say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, and I am fully pleased with them? Because if you are here today and you don't believe that God can say that about you, change something. If it's something big, change something small and work up to it. But if you don't feel in your heart 100%, that Jesus would say, this is my child, and I am fully pleased with them, change something. Now, the relevance of all this, for us, was summed in three simple words. Listen to him. This is my beloved son, and my, I am fully pleased with him. Listen to him. Now, Jesus is God's son, and we should listen to him. Now, the gospel reading that we went over this morning is known as the story of the transfiguration. Told you the Latin, how it comes to be, you know. It refers to the remarkable transformation that once took place in the appearance of Jesus. Now, when I looked at the passage, my first reaction was, why did this event take place? Why, why did God feel it necessary to reveal Jesus? Now, I think a key to the answer can be found in the context of the story. Um, that people had been asking the question who is Jesus we know that because Simon when, when Jesus asked them what, what is it that you want to ask Simon very quickly well, everybody wants to know who is Jesus so we know that it had been talked about who do people say the son of man is now, like I said it's clear from their response that this was a hot topic of the time you know, we knew and we know that church leaders had been talking about who is this Jesus and why is he preaching doctrine contrary to ours. Well, the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So there are people saying that Jesus is somebody else. He's not a Messiah. He's, he's another prophet. Now, if it hadn't been hot gossip at that time, they would have said that. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about why this had to happen. Why did this transfiguration have to happen? But it wasn't just the crowds who were talking about Jesus. His own disciples were asking the same question. They were asking, who is Jesus? Then he asked them, who do you say I am? And this is where... This is where I wanted to talk to you about when you read the Bible. Read it carefully. Read it thoroughly. Don't be afraid to make your own decisions. This is why I love Barbara's Bible study and, and hopefully the one that Sherry's doing and the one that Tara does. This is what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to read and if at any point of this reading we don't understand it or we have questions about it, we are to seek out other Christians and talk about it. In these verses, God did not condemn them. Even his own disciples were saying, well, who is Jesus? He wants to answer it. And he still wants to do that today. He's given us tools to answer it. Simon Peter, and Peter, you are the Messiah and the Son of the living God. So, once again, this question, who is this Jesus, was burning on everybody's lips. Now, in the previous chapter of Matthew 16, we see some human responses. Um, now, I didn't read those today, but like I told you, some people even said that he was a prophet. Chapter 17, we see that that's not true. We see the divine response. This is why the transfiguration had to take place. I believe the transfiguration took place because God the Father, for lack of a better word, tired of hearing it. He wanted to answer the question definitively once and for all. Who is Jesus? So we'll look at it in a little more detail. You know, if if everybody kept saying, well, who is Callie? Well, Callie's my stepdaughter. Yeah, but who is she really? Well, she's my stepdaughter. Yeah, but is she a good person? Yeah, she's great. She's my stepdaughter. And people kept asking me and asking me and asking me. Eventually, I'm going to find a way to prove that she is who I say she is. And that's what God did for us with Jesus. Everybody who is Jesus, who is Jesus. And God finally said, okay, 
I tried to tell you, but now we show it. So, at the Transfiguration, three major events occurred. Number one, Jesus' appearance was transformed and he transfigured. Um, he became a, a brilliant, brilliant um, excuse me, uh, light. Moses and Elijah appeared with him on the mountain. And God the Father spoke to the disciples. All of these were part of the Father's response to the question, who is Jesus? So let's look at the first significant event, the actual transfiguration. Jesus led Peter, James, and John up a high mountain, probably Mount Hermon. Hermon. I said it wrong in the first place. It's Hermon. Okay. 2,814 meters above sea level near Caesarea Philippi. There he transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now, part of the Father's response to the question, who is Jesus, was to reveal Jesus in his full glory. You know, at this point, all people had seen was Jesus in his mortal state. You know, baby the manger, grown man, 30 years old, looks like everybody else. Now, he doesn't look like everybody else. This is Jesus' full glory. Jesus' shown, face showed like the sun, his clothes became dazzling white. I alluded to this earlier for, for those of you who, who read the Old Testament about Moses. Moses came down Mount Sinai, having been in the presence of God, and his face shone so much reflecting the glory of God that he had to wear a veil for anybody to look at him. Here's the passage from Exodus 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony, holding the Ten Commandments in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses and that his face was radiant, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke. When Moses, Moses finished speaking to them, he put the veil over his face. Now, the same way as the glory of God was reflected in Moses, so God the Father revealed to Peter, James, and John Jesus and his glory. God the Father gave the disciples clear visual evidence of who Jesus is. And if you've been here the last few weeks, you know, we were, we were talking about the detective in the Bible, you know, um, the fact finder. This is very clear, and it states it very clear in the Bible. This was actual, visible evidence. So, now he's shown Jesus' actual form. The second significant event that happened at the Transfiguration was that Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus. Once again, we alluded to this. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. Now, I find it really significant like I told you before, that after God had spoken, Moses and Elijah disappear, and Jesus is alone. As one Bible commentator and theology put it, the law and the prophets have served their turn and pass away. He who is the fulfillment of both alone remains. Alpha, Omega, Old Testament, New Testament. Now we have one that represents both. <coughs> Another aspect of God the Father's answer is that Jesus is the one who will replace the Old Covenant. And then this is worth repeating, and I don't normally repeat, but this is really important. A new era is on the horizon during this event. I told you about the Epiphany. The Old Covenant, represented by Moses and Elijah, is going to pass away. It, it, it's not that it doesn't apply, but there is a new covenant coming. You are no longer eternally damned for your sins. A new covenant is going to come through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and you are going to be able to be cleansed. Whereas before, you were in trouble. There was no cleansing. All men were going to perish for their sins. The new covenant creates a relationship with Jesus that allows you to be saved. To me, that's significant. It's one of the most important things in the Bible. When did Jesus decide, or God decide, that I'm okay to be saved? 
And I believe it started right here with the passing of the old covenant to the passing of the new covenant. The Alpha and the Omega become both for my salvation. I can live now. Now in our church, we, we often discuss, even amongst ourselves, the difficulty of people getting people to come to church. Now I ask someone, what's your answer? How can I get, how can I get folks here? They stun me with their answer. I don't come to church. People don't come to church because they feel like they don't need to come to church. Now, I can't, how can I answer people when they say I live a good life? In fact, I'm as good as those people who go to church. I don't need to come to church to be a Christian. They're hard questions. I think the answer lies in the fact that Christianity does not solely equate with being good. This is Alpha, the Omega, the New, and the Old, and the New Covenant. They don't equate to being good. But rather, Christianity lies in our relationship with Jesus. You have to understand the significance of the events that are written here to even understand why you're able to be saved, what the new covenant is, why it's important. We come to church to worship God and to be thankful that a new covenant was created and that we don't have to live our lives in eternal hell. tell my kids all the time about putting on Jesus' armor because people will question you. And that was a great answer to why should I have to come to church? Man, I see you smoking. I'm better than you are. I don't smoke. But yet you're a Christian. Going to church doesn't make me a better Christian. It's like smoking doesn't make me a horrible Christian. It makes me a weak Christian. Something that I know we have to work at. But there's a reason it says he who is without sin casts the first stone. If you don't take a step to making yourself better, you're not going to be better. If you don't surround yourself with people of like thinking, you're never going to think outside of your own little box. So, that's my soap opera about, my soap box about uh, the arm of Christ. Now, the third significant event that happened at the Transfiguration was God the Father told the disciples who Jesus is. But even as Peter spoke, a bright cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son. I am fully pleased with him. Listen to him. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is where I was trying to tell you what would you do. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Jesus came over to them and touched them and said, Get up. Don't be afraid. And when they looked, they saw only Jesus with them. Now, it's interesting that when God the Father spoke, he simply said, this is my son and I am fully pleased with. Listen to him. Once again, we'll go back to that first question. Strong face. Who is Jesus? God the Father tells us very specifically, Jesus is his son. Jesus is revealed here in Matthew as, as God's son. So, now back to my realism. How is that relevant to me today? Really simple. It's relevant because of three words. And this is how I know God is omnipotent. Because long ago as this was written and translated, I can tell you how it's relevant right now. Listen to Jesus. When God the Father finished speaking, Elijah and Moses were gone, Jesus remained. This speaks to me of the primacy of Jesus. Listen to him. I, me and Tara, we tell people all the time, you know, with Forge, you know, we don't care where you're at. We want to get you on a good walk, but if you're not, we want you to get the life lesson. And this book is full of great life lessons. I tell my kids, you know, we have do good, be good, think good, talk. And I tell them all the time, no way is perfect but God. But try to do two out of three. And I'm going to give you the same advice. Try to do two out of three of those things because the chances are, if you're doing good and being good, you're thinking good thoughts. If you're thinking good thoughts and doing good, chances are you're being good. Listen to Jesus sounds so simple. But a lot of Jesus is preaching love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you want done unto you. 
I mean, these are life lessons that just make you a better person and a happier person. Now, we want you on that wall, you know. <clears throat> One of the most important, important Bible verses in, in, the, in the whole book to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He doesn't say sometimes. He doesn't say maybe. He says no one. So if you were living for God and you've accepted Jesus, that's how you get to God. If you haven't accepted Jesus, you're not getting to God. It's very clear that you have to accept Jesus to get to the Father. There's no other way to God than through Jesus. We don't have rules and regulations to keep to get to heaven. It's not a matter of being good. Rather, it is a matter of coming through Christ, as the Bible says. So the question that I want to ask you guys this morning, who do you think Jesus is? And I want you to think about it. Just sometimes today on your ride home or, or cooking dinner or eating dinner, just ask yourself, well, who do I think Jesus is? And I don't want you to think about it of Jesus is who he says he is. I, I want you to think deeper than that. I want you to really concentrate on what your idea of Jesus is. And then I want you to go find it in the Bible. Whatever you come up with, I want you to go find it. If you can't find it, you need to come up with a new answer. Because if it's not in here, it's not correct. If you believe what God the Father said, then the challenge is, are we prepared to listen to what Jesus has to say in our life? This is where it gets difficult. People always try to find the easier way. It's easy to say, I'm a Christian. It's much harder to act like a Christian, to walk like a Christian, to talk like a Christian. It's difficult at times. We get tested all the time. I'm so glad Tara did the welcome this morning. You know, patient. Matter of fact, you don't need to be done. Here, you take it. No, you take it. You know. But I could tell that she really needed that. And I, I told her when she was coming down, so I'm so glad you did that because I think you needed it as well. And we get tested. We get tested as Christians. And it, it's okay to get tested, but it's not okay to, to just fail. If you somebody asks you a question and you don't know it, you don't know the answer, find it, pray for it, ask somebody. You know, when I first started preparing this sermon on on transfiguration, I didn't I didn't even know how significant it was. I knew I knew about it, but but it was very very significant, and it leads up to a very 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 significant event. You know, just preparing this message. You know, I had to learn about the epiphany. I had to learn about what Jesus was getting his mind set to do. You know, this is the first step in God saying, this is my son. Now, a little bit later, Matthew, we know Jesus is going to Jesus is gonna break down. You know, why have you forsaken me? Why do I have to go through this? And everybody is here this morning. I'm telling you, Jesus went through this so you didn't have to. And that's one of the things I really want to leave you guys with. As we lead into the Easter season, it's significant what happens after this event. So, with that being said, I appreciate you all being here this morning. Um, thanks for listening to me. Hopefully, um, I explained it pretty well. Um, if you have any questions, you're more welcome to call me, text me, see me. I want you all to have a blessed week, and if there's anything anybody needs, just let us know. What I forget? Oh. <laughs> so, we're going to close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing me to speak your word. Thank you for allowing your words to come through me. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifices we know that you provide, that you constantly provide. We thank you for the new covenant that you provided on the mountain that day. We thank you for allowing your son to die for us, to cleanse us, to allow the new covenant to take place in our lives. Lord. We pray that anybody here today that hasn't accepted that new covenant, that they would think about, that they would really read about where they're heading, 
where their life is at in. And Lord, we just pray that as we continue to read your word through the week, that we get an understanding. And if we don't get an understanding, that we have the wisdom to go and find that understanding. And dear Lord, we just want you to be with everybody as they go home, to be with everybody through this week. And Lord, thank you again for this wonderful day. In your glorious Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The blessing of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost with you always. Amen.